So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar, Ahead of the Curve, Tips and Ideas for Best Practice Veterinary Operations. I'm Kimberly from the marketing team here at EasyVet and your host for today. It's been a few months now since practices started operating under social distancing guidelines and adopting contactless practices. It's become apparent that the new normal is here to stay. So we've joined forces with a few partners to highlight key areas where you can create efficiencies for now and beyond. Just a little housekeeping before we move on. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please add them in the Q&A chat box. We'll get them answered when we open the floor up for the general Q&A towards the end. Secondly, do keep an eye out for website links and live polls, which I'll be sharing throughout. As a matter of fact, here is a poll right now. So I'll just pop that through. And lastly, we will be providing you with a recorded version of this webinar. With that, I now have the pleasure of introducing our great lineup of subject matter experts and their agenda topics. First up, we have Tom Bivens, one of our implementation team leaders based in our Dallas office. In his two plus years at EasyBit, Tom has carried out dozens of projects of all scopes and sizes, from small mobile operations to university scale implementations, training thousands of users along the way. Tom is also a licensed vet veterinary technician, having practiced emergency and specialty medicine before switching gears to project management. Tom will kickstart the presentation with an overview of pra practical pr practice workflow tips. Representing Televet is Dr. Jennifer Quaman, who is a leader and advocate in the veterinary telemedicine space. She was part of the AVMA Practice Advisory Panel, a group that created the initial AVMA telemedicine policy about four years ago. Dr. Jen's background includes being a past president of the Kentucky VMA, a secretary of the Society for Veterinary Medical Ethics, and a chairwoman of the AVMA Council on Veterinary Service. On top of all this, she still films the time, she still finds the time to keep her license up to date across three states and practices small animal surgery. For this webinar, Dr. Jen will take you through the common pitfalls of telemedicine and typical use cases. We'll then have Pay Junction's Casey Russell, who's dialing in from sunny Santa Barbara. Casey is the EasyVet Partnership Manager at Pay Junction. However, at the dog park and beach, he is just Olive's dad. He spends his days consulting veterinarians on ways to create cleaner and more efficient payment workflows while trying to protect his toes from puppy teething. In, this, in his section, he'll cover the best practice check out and, method, uh, and payments uh, and define what contactless really means in terms of payment collection. On the other side of the States is John Archer from VetSource. John resides in Western New York with his wife, Leanne, son James, and six-year-old boxer Mayo. John has been with VetSource since 2016 and currently leads the training and development team. Prior to VetSource, John was at Patterson Veterinary Supply. We're really excited to have him here today to walk us through best practice home delivery and the benefits it can bring for practices and pet owners. Also in the Eastern time zone in Connecticut, just realized, uh, apologies about that. Also in the Eastern time zone in Connecticut is Michael Cody, CEO and founder of ReviewTree. ReviewTree has been a recent integration with EasyBit made available for our customers who wanted to take their feedback and review collection to the next level. Michael is very passionate about helping customers harness the power of the word of mouth. And in his portion of the webinar, who'll take you through the importance of client feedback and sentiment. We're also very fortunate today to have two practice managers and EasyVet customers for the customer panel. We have Marion Rowland from Park West Veterinary Associates in South Carolina and Liz Dar from The Park in Texas. They'll be chiming in and supporting some of our speakers throughout their portions and sharing how our integrations has especially helped them during these past few months. Thank you all for being here today. Now, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Tom to begin. Tom, please take it 
away. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I want to talk today a little bit about some workflow tips um, and really how clients have been rethinking um, curbside service and how that all works. So certainly, definitely um, a lot of challenges uh, that come along with that, but uh, with some creativity, we can really elevate things and take them to the next level. So there are a lot of small changes that we can make, but small changes in aggregate can have a really big impact. So within EasyVet, um, what a lot of people have been doing very successfully is including more information on the appointment booking itself, which will show up in those tooltips. So it makes it much easier to coordinate what's going on with those clients that are sitting out in your parking lot. With the recent implementation of custom appointment statuses, you can actually also create custom statuses to indicate what parking spot uh, particular clients are. So you don't wind up with that question, who's in spot three, what's in, where's my appointment, what's going on? So eliminating all of those little snags and drags can really go a long way. On top of that, leveraging telemedicine tools can be really important. And our friend, Dr. Jen, will be talking a little bit more about that shortly. But taking uh, history electronically and really leaning into those templates within EasyVet can help make sure that even though this is a stressful time and there's a lot, of, a lot going on, our technicians are still taking those accurate histories and getting all of that information that we need every time. On top of that, what I've seen uh, multiple practices implement is using JotForm. Um, so you can set up templates and send those out to clients. They can fill them out digitally, and then that way you're still collecting consent, getting signatures on those forms, and doing that completely touchless. Of course, teamwork makes the dream work. So uh, even though we are running these businesses, uh, it's very important to remember that um, as much client interaction as we have, our internal teams are just as important and we definitely need to communicate to them as well. Uh, additionally, our hospital teams are not immune to these new stresses. So managing morale is really important. Um, we all know how stressful and difficult it is ourselves. So uh, knowing that that's going on, we definitely wanna keep an, uh, an eye and an ear out for our team as well. Uh, I have seen multiple hospitals set teams that rotate for certain days or certain areas within the hospital. Um, we are in the midst of a pandemic, so making sure that we are conscientious of what protocols we might implement to reduce exposure um, can go a long way. It's also important to leverage the tools that are available. So within EasyVet, we do have the ability to uh, generate and send out mass communications, be that email or text message. You can do that uh, either with automated communications, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with by now, but we do also have the ability to generate those a little bit more on the fly based on split using the records dashboard. On top of that, the ebooking and online portal can be a really valuable tool to lean into and um, make greater use of. Uh, in that we can get clients redirected to the online portal, not just for booking appointments, but also to view documents, look at their pet's standard of care, and request refills. So diverting some of that traffic from you, away from your phones and into the online portal um, frees up your front of house staff to field all of those, those calls. And we are seeing higher, much higher volume of calls uh, across every hospital that I've been to. Touchless or online payment systems um, are really, really great to have now. And our friend Casey Pajach will be talking more about that. And then there are also some telemedicine developments uh, within EasyVet as well that we can really leverage to make sure that we're still seeing uh, a good volume of patients and also delivering that good care. So whether that's a true telemedicine appointment, the clients at home and you're Zooming and discussing with them or the clients in the parking lot and you're still communicating with them digitally, but you've got that pet in the exam room. So with uh, a lot of these small changes, like I said, we can make a large impact and uh, really take something that is uh, a challenge 
and turn it into an opportunity. Well, without further uh, ado, I'll hand you over to our telemedicine expert, Dr. Jen, and she'll take it from here. While I'm switching over, there is um, a poll up about related to telemedicine, so feel free to uh, submit some answers to that and let me do just a full screen share here for you. So um, I appreciate, thanks Tom for the kind of fill in there and I'll, I'll always, I always like to fill in that um, in addition to being a veterinarian and I am a practicing veterinarian, I'm speaking to you today from Kentucky. So um, that's the part of the country that I'm hiding in. And prior to veterinary school, I spent a number of years as a licensed technician. So you'll hear a common theme from me when I'm talking about telemedicine now or probably anywhere you see me, um, that I think this is a really great opportunity for us to utilize um, our staff and actually elevate the level of uh, professionalism of our technicians, particularly in our clients' eyes. Um, and so this is a way I want you to think of telemedicine as not just one more thing um, for you to have to do or for the veterinarian to have to do, but I want this to be thought of as a way that we can really accentuate the relationship that we have with our pet owners, um, continue doing some follow-up care, doing some pre-appointment um, discussions and some other kind of tidbits we'll talk about. So the main emphasis we're going to focus on tonight or today, depending on where you're at, um, is thinking about contactless practice. So again, we are in this uh, time of pandemic that is going to be here with us for some time. Uh, telemedicine is here now. It's going to be with us in the future. It's been with us, with us in the past. Uh, and so I don't want you to think of telemedicine as this new sort of scary thing. Pretty much any time that you've been working on a patient or consulting with a client about a patient and not had that animal directly in front of you, you are doing telemedicine. So when you're chatting with someone about, you know, labs over the phone, you know, or emailing back and forth, all of those are forms um, of telemedicine that you've been already utilizing. Televet is a way that you can sort of incorporate that into one succinct place, have communications, and then ultimately directly include that into your electronic medical record. So that can be sent straight over to EasyVet. So really nice ways that we can sort of accentuate and, and help one another out here. Demand, obviously, for telemedicine changed pretty dramatically in the U.S. in uh, the spring. Um, so in March, things really um, kind of exploded a little bit for us. And uh, what I see is this is, again, a really good opportunity for us to improve our patient outcomes, improve the satisfaction for our pet owners, and sometimes really for our um, pets, um, capturing some charges for the advice and some of the things that you're discussing with pet owners and have been doing for years, but finalizing a way to, to capture all of that communication and capture the, the charges for that. And again, as I mentioned, sort of utilizing the entire and full healthcare team. So from the point of view of a phone call coming in or an email coming in or a request coming in over Televet, really incorporating the team to triage that case, move that through the process, uh, and whether that patient winds up coming in for a physical examination or you do everything virtually, um, this is a nice streamlined way to continue those communications there. If you're thinking about telemedicine, I, you know, I guess I'm going to start with the, the downsides or what I see people have as like stumbling blocks. Um, and so just things for you to think about if you're um, intending to use telemedicine, if you're already using it and want to sort of maximize your use. Some of the common things that I see people struggle with a bit um, are implementing uh, telemedicine. And so we are maybe not doing full planning of like why we're actually engaging telemedicine in the practice. So think about that if you're managers, if you're owners, if you're um, medical directors in your practices, what is the reason, what's the why that you're actually incorporating um, telemedicine? So it could be any all or potentially some of these different options, but is this so you can see more patients? Is this so you can offer some offsite work options for your team members, um, thinking about people during pandemic, but also thinking about people on maternity and paternity leave, thinking about people recovering from injuries. This is a way you can still keep them engaged in the practice. Are you utilizing this to attract new clients? Are you utilizing it as a way to increase access to care if you're in a place that's uh, very remote? Um, it's hard to maybe get to patients or potentially there's weather incidents. Maybe this is a way you can actually increase access to care. 
Um, and again, right now, there's a huge push to limit human to human contact. And so that's a big piece of it. So outside of not really thinking about what's the, the strategy or what's your why, um, the next sort of uh, stumble I think I see for people is they're maybe not having full training of their staff and their doctors. So you just kind of dump this in their lap and say, here you go, here's one more thing to do. Um, and it's not much different in a way than buying that $30,000 ultrasound machine that then sits in the corner and collects dust. You really need to find a way to incorporate this into your practice and into your workflow. So this is gonna take a little strategizing with your team. You know, it's probably a little trial and error, but how does this actually fit into your workflow um, for each of the members of the team and how do we really offer this as option one? The healthcare team's too busy. We're all dealing with this. I saw that poll at the beginning of, the, um, beginning of our session today and asking about who's at 100% capacity and probably some of you like me were looking for who's at 100% plus capacity. Um, like we're just really going. I was in the clinic today uh, and we're you know, constantly seeing that push to, to keep, uh, keep up with the needs of our patients and our clients. One of the other pitfalls we run across is a little bit of fear of change. This is not a bad thing. We are creatures of habit. Um, what we're doing is working. And so we don't feel like we wanna just learn something new um, but what I would tell you is I really do think and feel strongly, and, and again, I've been using telemedicine for a number of years, that if you slow down a little bit, think about your strategy and how to engage this, you'll actually find that you'll be able to see more patients and, and handle things with clients um, in a new and different way that will keep them, keep them engaged in the process. And then that final piece, and this is a little farther down the road uh, for people is maybe not actually taking advantage of marketing the fact to your pet owners that you're offering Televet or offering telemedicine, like letting people know that this is there. Is this on your website? Is it on your social? You know, where are ways are you using those email campaigns like Tom talked about earlier to actually push this out and let pet owners know that this is an option for them. I'll mention just a few kind of high level use cases. Um, I work mostly in small animal, but this could cross cut to large animal and equine as well. Particularly things around dermatology are really, really common places that we see use cases. Um, I will get pet owners that send a picture of, hey, will you take a look at this dermatitis or take a look at this wound or is this a broken toenail that I need to deal with today? Um, and most of the time I find our pet owners really just wanna know, like, do I need to go to the emergency clinic today? Or is this something that can wait and we can kind of work in in the next couple of days? And, and honestly, they will pay for you to, to tell them like, you're okay, here's some things we can start now. Yes, we still need to kind of see this pet down the road, but here are some really easy ways for you to initiate a conversation around dermatology and or as a follow-up. Um, and so you've already seen, and we all know, we see these germ cases, and these are chronic conditions that we're seeing, these atopy patients and these food allergic patients, and I want to prescribe foods, I want to prescribe medications, and I want to know how they're doing, and it's hard for pet owners to get that dog loaded back and get into the hospital, so this is a really great way that you can video chat, capture that conversation, do that follow-up, and actually do a better job of servicing that patient and that pet owner at the end of the day. And again, for me, I think this is an awesome place for our technical staff to take the lead. Like, I don't need to be the one to lead that conversation. The team can do that and include the veterinarians when they, when they need. Curbside, everyone is doing it right now, right? This is everywhere. So how are you utilizing this in your workflow? For me right now, a curbside case often looks like um, an assistant or a technician going to retrieve the animal, the owner's parked out in the, you know, in the lot somewhere, and if the owner is open to it, I'm literally using Televet and video chatting with the owner in real time. So it's, um, it's as close to an actual normal appointment as I can make it right now. Um, maybe this is a drop off, they go home and we video chat from there, but literally the only thing extra I need is either a, you know, a phone with video, which pretty much everybody has these days, or a tablet and a tripod. Um, and either an extra person to hold the camera or a tripod there. You can do your normal workflow. You can have a conversation with your pet owner and you can show them things as you're going through your exam. And so I think this is a really great way to continue to build that bond between us and our, our pets and our pet owners. The last piece and the other really common place that we'll see um, are follow-up cases. So are you actually thinking about how you're going to follow up on a surgical case? How are you going to follow up on a dentistry? I'm amazed how well 
pet owners can get pictures from an inside of a mouth or um, an extraction site or, you know, get a look at a dog's incision um, that they'll roll over at home and take a better picture than when they're in the clinic and they're bouncing everywhere, right? So um, hopefully you'll find this is a really useful option for you as well. The poll results have come up. I'll just pause for a second to talk about that. So it looks like most of you, nearly 90% uh, nearly, um, of you did not have a telemedicine product prior to pandemic. So probably many of you are like the clients that Televet has, has engaged with. So hopefully this is an opportunity for you to think about how can we use it, not just now, but really going forward. I do think this is here to stay. COVID has just pushed that timeline a little bit. Um, and big challenges, one of the challenges that people are seeing with implementing telemedicine um, is upskilling the staff. So really talking about how to empower the staff to utilize this. And I think that's something that they just need some coaching and some encouragement that like they know they're the animal experts, not the pet owners. Um, and so encouraging your staff to really give it a go, give it a try. If you need me, I'm here. It's no different than training someone the first time they're placing an IV catheter or getting a history from a pet owner. It's a similar thing. Just think of it in a very natural workflow. So thank you for engaging in that. And then um, the last little piece for me before I turn it over to Olive, because I think she's going to run the show from here, um, is just thinking about high level benefits of Televet and telemedicine. So I see this as a great opportunity for veterinarians, veterinary technicians um, to protect your own private information. You're not giving away your own social media. You're not using your personal email. You're not using your personal cell phone, but you're still capturing that information. You're integrating medical records. Once I'm done with the consult, it literally just uploads into the cloud. And so it's there in the EMR. You're capturing charges. Um, you can do that ahead of time or at the moment. And you're really elevating the abilities of the technical staff and your CSRs. So I hope um, this will give you some opportunities to think about that. And I think without further ado, I'll pass it to Olive to maybe talk about us, maybe Casey to talk about uh, checkouts and payments. Yeah, we will see if I can get Olive to wake up here in a minute. Um, I'm going to grab the screen share really fast. And then go from there. So like Kimberly said at the beginning of the call, uh, my name is Casey Russell and I manage the EasyVet partnership here at Pay Junction. I think with uh, Dr. Jen, with Kimberly and with Thomas, the real star of the show for me is going to be Olive. So let me see if I can grab her real fast and uh, show her to you. She's in the middle of a nap, but she doesn't mind. She actually enjoys the camera. So here's little Olive, little precious. And truthfully, I'd love nothing more than to just sit here and show you guys videos over on my phone. We just had puppy class yesterday and that was phenomenal. But instead, what I'm going to talk about is something that's changed drastically for everyone over the past three or four months. And that's the checkout process and how you take payments. So the two main areas that we've really seen a, a, a seismic shift in is telemedicine and the curbside checkout. Dr. Jen did a fantastic job of explaining the benefits and, and frankly, the need of making telemedicine a core functionality in, in your practice. And then on top of that, you have the curbside model, which has been widely adopted by veterinarians across the country. In both these scenarios, the client's no longer coming inside to make the payment, so the workflows have changed drastically. So the question is, what can you do to ensure that you're still collecting payments efficiently? Um, a couple of things we've seen, allocating a specific team, man manage, team member to manage those payments or specific team members. As with everything with repetition, that'll cause an increase of inefficiency and it frees up time for the doctor to move on to the next appointment. And then you have the technology piece. Evaluating your current payments technology stack to make sure you're able to do things like charge a card on file for the customer, uh, especially um, if you're looking to get a, uh, an anxious pup out the door, being able to charge the card instantly and get him back to the owner as quickly as you possibly can. Huge benefit to both the pup and the owner. And then the ability to text or email a payment link for new customers. So me personally, I can tell you I've been to a couple emergency hospitals, unfortunately, with the pup, uh, earplugs and a foxtail. That'll get you every time. And both times they were able to give me a call and collect my card over the phone. Uh, but it would have been a lot more seamless personally if they could have just emailed me or texted me a payment link so I could make that payment. 
And really what I'd like to do now is pass this off to Marion from Park West Vet. Uh, Marion, can you talk a bit about how Park West Vet has increased efficiency with all the workflow changes around collecting payments that have arose from in implementing the curbside and telemedicine appointments? Yeah, thanks, Casey. Um, hey, everybody. So we, prior to COVID um, changing all of our lives, we adopted the EasyVet software. We made the switch uh, from Avamark to EasyVet, um, not knowing that having a cloud-based software was going to be one of the most integral parts of having a successful curbside process with COVID. Um, one of the great, greatest integrations, in my opinion, with EasyVet is Pay Junction. Um, it allows us to save cards on file with EasyVet, um, and it makes it very easy to check clients out. Um, so you have the combination of the cloud-based software and the cards on file for the client. All can be done from an iPad in the parking lot with a client in their car. So it has been tremendous in allowing us to um, just have a very efficient curbside process, a very safe curbside process. It's contactless. Um, and it's just, we have um, really reaped the benefits of, of both of those softwares working together so well. Awesome, thank you, Marion. So let's talk a bit about the future of payments. Um, as I'm sure everybody in here has heard, the buzzword in payments right now is contactless. And even before COVID, contactless payments were, were pretty much on the rise. Uh, this graph here by Statista shows exactly that. And what we're seeing today is the card brands making a push that feels reminiscent to the EMB switch back in 2015, which I'm sure everybody remembers. And we only expect these contactless numbers to continue to grow. The difference between contactless and EMB as where with EMB, where it was just the card brands pushing for the switch, with COVID, what we're now seeing is pressure from all angles and sides to move to a contactless environment. So if I can get the graph to switch over, what you'll see is that a straw group survey showed that 77% of consumers are at least moderately concerned about spreading germs when interacting with payment terminals. And all these data points so far, this is at a high level basically the aggregate economy. So let's narrow down into veterinar the veterinary vertical specifically. This third slide here was, and it's what we're looking at is it's showing that both veterinarians and their clients, primary concern is the transmission of germs from either clients to clients or staff to staff or staff to clients. So, how has that affected our industry? If we look at this next one, you'll see that 65% of the practices that took the same AVMA survey have adopted contactless payments on, in order to support social distancing and to keep those concerns at ease as much as they can. So let's talk about contactless for a second. The one thing we don't want to confuse contactless with is NFC enabled, the ability to take your Apple Pay and your Google Wallet, Fitbit Pay, if, if you bump into someone, evidently it exists, I haven't seen it. Um, so it, it's constantly evolving, this term. But the things we need to consider are limiting the three points of exposure in the checkout process. So if you're letting customers inside, you have the customer to staff exposure point. So how you can eliminate the exposure there, you're talking about a customer facing terminal, so you don't have to pass a, the card back and forth. Contactless payments, so when we say contactless, we mean NFC, the Apple Pay, the Google Wallet, and then disabling paper signatures and receipts. So I'm sure everybody's been somewhere where there's a clean pen cup and a dirty pen cup. Visa, MasterCard, and Discover have disabled the requirement for um, signatures in a card present environment, so there's no longer a need for that. And then when you have device to, to customer, pretty similar. So you still need the, the contactless payment. So that way everyone's not touching it. Um, disable signatures and receipts and then consistently disinfect the device. So when you go to the grocery store today, I'm sure other than the avocados, which I'm guilty of, I touch them all when I'm trying to find a couple. The payment terminal is probably the one 
dirtiest place in there. And it's always nice to give customers the peace of mind. Keep, just keep it disinfected at all times. And then customer to customer, uh, signs promoting the, the acceptance of these contactless payments, super important, and signs promoting social distancing. And then if you can, some hand san sanitizer or wipes for the customer to use so that way once they're done, they can leave clean, no worries, nothing like that. Now let's talk about tips. So let me take a look at this data real fast. So have you implemented contactless payment? 78%, that is fantastic. Um, we, will, we will get to that one, it's more of a, a 0.3, I think. Um, we have a lot of different ways people are taking card information for the curbside and telemedicine, but more than half taking card information over the phone and manually keying it in. So this tip number one is for the half of you out there. If you're collecting that card information, um, be, be sure that you're not hurting your business. Veterinarians have done a phenomenal job. They've literally pivoted their entire business type in order to make their staff, make the clients, make the pets, make everybody feel safe and to limit exposure. But we cons what we consistently run into is they're neglecting and not even necessarily neglecting. They don't, um, know that it's costing their business more money. Upwards almost of 25% additional to your credit card processing fees if you're not collecting all the appropriate information. So when I say appropriate information, I mean the ABS, the address verification, which will be um, essentially the, the address for the customer matching the billing address on file, and then the CVV for security. So ensure you have the technology in place that allows you to collect those things and you have it turned on. Step two, we've moved to a contactless environment. We've moved to a card not present environment. So if you're doing all curbside, the need for a signature now becomes there again. So you moved into a card not present environment. Visa MasterCard and Discover decides that that's less of a secure environment. So you want a signature in the case of a dispute. Um, the ability to send out Basically, a receipt to get that signature will protect you from any disputes that arise. Get authorization and documentation uh, of that authorization in the event something happens. And then step three, this is constantly evolving. Um, it's a different landscape um, today than it was yesterday, and it's going to be different tomorrow than it is today. So try to prepare yourself for the next step, and maybe not even the next step, but the step after that. We have states that are opening up. We have states that are closing back down. It's just a, a mixed bag all across the country. But we all know eventually, six months, 12 months, 18 months down the road, clients are going to be able to come back inside. So prepare yourself for a completely different client psyche because you're still going to be uncomfortable touching things. You're still going to have that fear in the back of your head of, oh man, I need to wash my hands as quickly as possible. I'm sure none of us had, or maybe a few of us had a hand sanitizer in our car before this. Now I have two of them. Um, so evaluate your current terminal setup and make sure that you have that contactless environment. You have the customer facing and upgrade yourself sooner rather than later to get ahead of the game. And that's about it. If there's any questions, uh, Kimberly sent out how to collect those. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to my man, John. Yeah, thank you, Casey. Um, also, big thank you to EasyVat, our friends here for hosting us. Uh, Dr. Jen as well. I will say I was jotting down some notes as everyone spoke. Uh, there's some recurring themes that I think you'll hear in this next portion too. Um, so before we dive in, just a little bit about that source. Uh, we're a home delivery provider. We offer pharmacy and technology services to over 9,000 practices here in the United States. Um, we're processing well over 5 million items each year on behalf of our partner veterinarians. Uh, so home delivery, it is, it's not a brand new concept to the industry. Uh, the demand for it is certainly accelerated uh, given COVID-19. Um, but I will say if you don't have a home delivery partner today, that is by no means too late. Uh, there's some great options out there. Today, we're going to talk about some of the foundational items that are critical to success. Uh, we'll also get into um, some real do's and don'ts, if you want, or some watch outs. 
uh, when you're implementing your home delivery program. Uh, with a little bit of luck, we'll get through this without a uh, mischievous dog or toddler walking in. Um, no promises on that one. So when you're looking at your partners, uh, really there's what I call the table stakes of a successful home delivery offering. Um, so you want to make it easy for your staff to prescribe and recommend products, right? We just saw everyone's at capacity or over these days. Um, so certainly something that, that fits into the workflow and is easy and efficient for your team. Uh, the expectations of pet owners changes by the day. Uh, so it's really essential to offer a convenient online shopping and delivery experience for them so that they can do business with you at their convenience outside of the four walls of your practice. Um, and then make sure that you've got the tools that you need to drive that awareness for your pet owners. Uh, I think that was one of the pitfalls we heard uh, from Televet as well, is they can't leverage this if they're not aware that it's an option. Um, and we'll dive into here in a little bit how you'll use each of these three key areas. Uh, so first things first, and this again, hearkening back to what Dr. Jen shared, um, I think she'd phrase it as, hey, what's your why? Why are we doing this? Um, it's really important to set some goals for your home delivery. Go into this with a plan. Maybe you're trying to drive compliance. Maybe it's workflow efficiencies, right? You want to improve your operation. Uh, it could just be, hey, I need to compete online and I want to offer the best pet owner experience. Uh, there's a lot of different goals out there and I'll say you're not alone. Uh, you don't have to kind of figure these out on your own. Reach out to your partner, reach out to us at VetSource. Um, each practice's goals are going to be a little bit different and we're here to help define those for you and implement them. Once you've established your goals, uh, take some time to align your pricing strategy to those goals. So at VetSource, for instance, we have a few kind of out of the box, easy to implement pricing strategies. It could be anywhere from, hey, I wanna keep a really healthy margin and I'll use promotional codes, let's say, to, to get me more competitive on the pricing end. Or maybe you're on the other side of the scale where it's, I just wanna be as competitively priced as I can I'm okay with sacrificing some margin. We'll make up for that in volume, uh, but I really want to be the low cost leader. And maybe it's somewhere in between, right? So it's important to think about your practice. Think about the goals that you set out. I heard a great quote the other day. It was uh, goals transform a random walk into a chase. And that really resonated with me. Uh, and so define a goal, define a pricing strategy for all of these at VetSource. Um, you can pick a strategy and then customize individual products to the price point that you want. So it's not a one size fit all per se. And the more time you're putting into this upfront, the more successful your program is going to be in the long run. Here's another recurring theme. I think Tom said teamwork makes the dream work. Uh, we always say here it takes a village. We certainly recommend uh, get a home delivery champion or two in your practice. But really for this to be successful, it's important to communicate to your team, first of all, why if you brought in a home delivery partner. And then second of all, what's their role in all of this? Um, this slide will highlight some examples of what those roles can look like. Uh, but again, it's not always a one size fits all uh, type of thing here. So reach out to your partner, reach out to us. We'll give you some contact information at the end and we can help to find hey, you know what, we want the veterinarians making this recommendation in the room. Maybe it's the CSR collecting payment, whatever that might be. Um, but again, once those are established, it's key to communicate that to the team. Let them know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, this is a crucial one that we see a lot. It's, yeah, we have home delivery and, and we tell all of our pet owners who want home delivery about it, but we really only tell the pet owners that want home delivery. Um, the reason we say to avoid this is there's numbers that show more and more consumers want home delivery today, uh, the vast majority, whether it's through practice or whether it's just in their day-to-day -day life. They're, they're just used to ordering things and getting them shipped to their house. Um, the other big reason we say to avoid this is the way our practices that follow this approach are finding out definitively that their clients want home delivery is that fax machine is going off and they're getting a prescription request from a competitive online pharmacy, right? So we wanna get out in front of that. Um, rather than trying to convert those faxes over, we'd rather just promote it so that they know, oh, I can get this right here from my veterinarian that I'm comfortable going to. 
and they're not even straying away to those other online pharmacies. So what we do recommend, right, is drive awareness at any chance that you get, um, whether that be an invoice, uh, if you're using something like intake forms today, it's a certainly a great option to say, hey, would you like these medications shipped right to your house? We can do that for you. Uh, invoices, whatever it might be, uh, promote that this great service is available as an option for them. Uh, what you see in front of you at VetSource, we have a marketing toolkit. Uh, it's free for you to access and use. It's got all sorts of great social media content, stuff you can use in the building or put on the door, website banners, all sorts of great tools. Uh, we're updating those on a very regular basis that are right there for you to use to promote this offering. Uh, we also have a program called PetMail. So that's an email marketing service that comes with your home delivery program. And what it does is it allows you to offer clients these great promotions without impacting your profit margin whatsoever. These emails are branded to your practice, right? Because you're the one with the relationship. They're shopping with you. So these will be emails branded right to your practice. And our practices that are using PetMail, on average, they're generating about 98% more in revenue than those that don't. Um, so it's definitely great to take advantage of that. Uh, really useful stuff, content and promotions that go out to your pet owners there. I will say in you know, promoting value too, beyond just pet mail, there's manufacturer sponsored promotions, there's auto ship promotions, there's first order promotions. There's all sorts of great ways that you can save that pet owner some money but keep your margin whole because the manufacturer or the home delivery provider is sponsoring those. Um, so keeps you intact, right? So you're keeping that healthy profit margin, offering a great value to your pet owner because you're saving them some money. Um, so they're there for you to use. Uh, it's just, again, sometimes folks don't know that that's an option. So definitely offer those up whenever available. Uh, this is another one that we see a lot of, and it's, it's refilling those monthly preventatives, right, at a single dose. So someone says, oh, I, I'll take one dose of heartworm today, and then they come back a month later, and you're dispensing one at a time. Uh, we recommend that you stop doing that out of practice. Uh, the big reason is, well, one, it's a compliance killer. We just know that folks aren't able to get back in there as much as they need. But also, it's really not profitable when you think of all the steps it takes to repackage that, take the phone call, get the doctor's approval, enter that information. Uh, by the time you've dispensed that single dose, you're really leaving money on the table or losing money there. So rather than, dis than fulfill those in practice, uh, you can embrace something like, like auto ship and remind me where, yeah, give them that first month supply when they were there for their wellness visit, um, but then get them set up on a single dose auto ship program, like what we call Remind Me. And the way Remind Me works is each month we'll deliver a single dose of whatever that parasiticide preventative is right to that pet owner's doorstep. They pay for it one dose at a time and it goes on an auto ship there. Uh, you only have to set it up one time. So it's really efficient for the workflow of your staff, but you know that pet is still getting what they want when they need it. Uh, so if we look at this chart here to the right, this looks at heartworm compliance. And we see pet owners when purchasing in practice only, that pet is only getting four to six months of coverage. Uh, whereas by leveraging something like Remind Me, that number jumps to 10 to 11 doses. Um, and even if you were to set aside the compliance and the revenue that's gonna generate, uh, it's really a good flexible option for those pet owners. Uh, studies are showing now um, north of 50% of working Americans are living paycheck to paycheck today. So really it can be a challenge to buy that six months up front or that year supply up front. Whereas with Remind Me, it's a much more comfortable option for them where they can just pay for that one dose at a time when they need it. Uh, the chart to the left shows a very similar story with food. Um, so on average clients, they're buying about two bags of food out of practice. Uh, and really the big big driver there is it's not the most convenient thing when they run out of food to have to drive to the practice to pick up that next bag, especially during today's times, right? Where we're trying to avoid face-to-face -face interactions like that. So by having a home delivery offering and putting that diet on an auto shipment, we see that number jump to eight to even 12 bags of food. Um, so great flexible option, but also uh, 
a great revenue, frankly, driver for your practice. And here's where we talk about the best way to kind of get them set up on that. And I'll say uh, the one thing in my mind that's more convenient than being able to go online and shop around and get something sent to my house is to have my veterinarian go ahead and just do it for me and send it to me when I need it. Um, so you can actually, uh, using a tool that we call ScriptWrite, in less than a minute, you can get a pet owner set up on home delivery for any of those medications or food or preventatives or what have you. Uh, in less than a minute, collect the payment, get it sent to their house, and that can be on an auto ship too. So really efficient, great pet owner experience because you're doing all the work for them. Uh, they come to you because they want these recommendations from you. Um, so really powerful option there. What I will say is there's instances where a pet owner wants to follow your recommendation and they want to truly do what's best for their pet. But it could be a scenario where they've got to talk with their spouse and make sure that it's, you know, the right decision for them. Or they know like money might be a little bit tight and that they, they'll do it, but they've got to wait for that that right paycheck. And, and that's certainly a fair circumstance and, and a common one, I would argue. Um, and what you can do in that scenario is you can say, no problem, we totally understand. I'm going to send you an email. It's going to have that product that we talked about. And it'll have a link right to our e-commerce site so that when you're ready to make that purchase, all you've got to do is click on that link. It'll log in so you don't have to worry about digging up a password or anything like that. Enter that payment information. Uh, it's a nice reminder of, hey, it's there for you when you need it. We do think it's an important product for your pet's therapy, um, but certainly understand the circumstances. So we'll, we'll have that waiting for you whenever you're ready. Um, so again, I think we went through kind of a few high level items here in the last few minutes. Uh, I know we've got some other great insights coming up, so I'll, I'll be brief in closing and say towards the end here, uh, we will provide ways to contact us and, and we can take some of what we talked about and make that work for your individual practice or share some other things that we've seen people be successful with. Um, but with that, I don't wanna go over my time and it's my pleasure to turn it over to the founder and CEO of ReviewTree right now, who's got, I know, some excellent insights to share. So Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Great job. Let me just get over here and share this. Here we go. Right, perfect. So yes, thank you so much for uh, for that helpful information and introduction as well. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about keeping clients and your teams engaged and touching on why it's so important to be collecting client feedback and evaluating sentiment, especially when you're making operational changes. Um, one of the things that we found, as Jen had mentioned, is as there's an increasing um, objective of minimizing human contact, you really need to be able to stay in touch with, uh, with clients. So with that in mind, um, just a brief overview about ReviewTree. We have collected uh, responses from probably 100,000 veterinary interactions and clients. We are uh, use these automated tools to be able to collect client feedback, um, generate net promoter score, calculate uh, online reviews and generate increasing amounts of those, as well as track referral sources and engage referral agents to help them to recommend the practice uh, more frequently than, than ever before. So what we found is now that a lot of practices are operating in a low touch work environment, um, and that we're not getting that face-to-face -face time. What we're seeing is that about 90% of all veterinary practice clients, when they're re responding to their visits, they're talking specifically about the quality of the staff and the practice's communication with them. So this is something that has always been important for clients, but it's increasingly uh, essential, especially when they don't have the opportunity to spend 15, 20 minutes, you know, talking with multiple staff members about what's taking place with their, you know, their animal's care. So a couple best practices, if you're going to be setting up and running a feedback campaign, 
Um, especially with everybody being at or over capacity from a workload standpoint. If you're able to automate this, um, it's really helpful. So we just popped up a quick survey. You know, do you currently have a system for collecting feedback from an appointment? So some people have an automatic one, some people have a manual one, some don't have any. Um, and sort of an extension of that is, are you actively generating online reviews or letting that kind of passively happen by itself? Well, let me just go back one. So when you're getting those responses coming back, and if you set up an automatic system, you should get plenty of, of responses. You want to make sure that you're responding to client concerns and potentially client praise. Um, I realize everybody is strapped with work and, you know, are stretched relatively thin. But even a couple quick comments uh, back to a client can make a world of difference. And it lets them know that they've been heard. Um, another key aspect is to share those client responses that you get back with staff members. Um, the majority of content that you're going to receive from your customers is going to be positive. Statistically, it'll be about 93 to 96% of your customer feedback is going to say how wonderful and awesome and appreciative they are. By sharing that with your staff, you can really help get them through difficult times. It improves their morale. And it also gives them a greater sense of accountability because they can see how their interactions really impact and color the experience that clients are having. And it's helpful to share negative feedback with them as well because there's going to be opportunities for adjustments or learning or training that are going to be reinforced by what clients are sharing with you. So a couple just tips if you are automating a feedback process, whether you use EasyVet or any other practice management solution, um, you want to be timely. So try to send those requests for feedback out. Um, our data shows that if it's within five days, you'll get a reasonable response rate. But the more, uh, the closer to the appointment day, probably the better results you will get. Um, we don't suggest people postponing it two weeks or three weeks or a month. Um, it just ends up getting too far out of mind and, and your response rates will drop. Um, we also suggest setting it up so you can automatically block uh, if an animal is deceased, if a surgery or emergency appointment does, goes, does not go well. You typically do not want to be surveying those clients with a, hey, how did we do? Um, you'll get back responses that you probably were not intending. Um, finally, even if you have clients where the outcome was not a deceased animal, some folks just don't take to receiving requests for feedback. Um, we suggest if you're using EasyVet, you can use tags to block surveys on a client-by-client -client basis. Other systems will have other methods that you can use, but make sure you enable your staff to be able to mark records that shouldn't be receiving this type of follow-up. They'll be relatively small, but it'll avoid making that sensitive client even more sensitive. A couple changes that have taken place as a result of people staying in and social distancing and not you know, speaking with their neighbor over the white picket fence is the consumer consumption and viewing of online reviews has doubled uh, since February. And basically, an explanation that if you think about streaming services or any online stuff, um, basically, if you can do it from a phone and a device and it gets you the information or content that you need, it probably has increased in the last three or four months and reviews are no different. So you really want to strive to kind of get your, your review perspective. If somebody's looking for you online, whether it's Facebook, Google, or Yelp, um, we have an example of one of our clients here at the park. Um, this is really what practices should be striving for. 600 plus uh, reviews on Google every single day, they're getting feedback coming through that's reinforcing this. So I see from the data that's coming back that about half the folks in, in, on the call today have an automated process for feedback, which is great. Um, about half of them have, a, have none or a manual one. And as far as review generation, it's pretty much Similar, about a third have an automated process, 20% manual and 43% none. And these two things can kind of connect together. You can do one or both or jointly within the same steps. So part of how the review tree platform works, and many of them are similar, is we're collecting that feedback up front, 
Um, our system is offering to make charitable donations to things like the ASPCA as an ethical incentive to get people to share their comments. Happy folks can then uh, post their comments online if they opt into that. Um, when you have a busy practice uh, like the park, you know, they were able to generate 127 five-star reviews in just the last 60 days. So within the two months of, of COVID, they've gotten an increasingly larger amount of their client base talking about their positive experiences. And part of what we see in both the online reviews and just the general client feedback that's coming across is that there's useful information that your customers will offer to you to help give you guidance about the operational changes that you may be taking. So what we're seeing in, in the data that we're evaluating for practice is about 30% of all client survey responses are talking in some way about COVID related changes to care. So it could be, hey, you minimize you know, my need to come in or touch surfaces, or I appreciate everybody wearing masks, or you know, I, I had curbside pickup and I really wanted to do it face to face. So you'll, you can get useful information that whenever something like COVID happens or you've got rules changing, I think as uh, Casey had mentioned, you know, states are opening, states are closing, rules are constantly changing and your practice is trying to adjust. Well, how do you know that you're making changes in a way that your clients are appreciative of and that they support? Well, they'll tell you. So with that, I'm gonna pass this over to Liz from the park in Texas. She's gonna talk a little bit about the use of feedback for a couple key COVID related topics that her practice had put in place. Um, so Liz, if it's all right, I'm gonna to continue to share my screen, but I'll pass the microphone over to you so you can talk a little bit about your use of client feedback in evaluating practice changes related to COVID. Yeah, no, great. You know, one of the greatest things about ReviewTree is the, the real-time client feedback that you receive. You know, it's allowed us to have an accurate diagnosis of, you know, what we're doing right, what we need to change, implement, and adjust. Um, you know, if we talk about the social distance markers, what we found is that we can actually use this feedback to act as a sort of checkpoint for policy execution. So, you know, implementing a strict social distancing policy was one of the first COVID-related policies that we put into place. Um, the feedback that we continue to receive indicates that our clients value and appreciate it and that our, our team is enforcing and executing it. And then, um, so we go on to, to curbside and in-person visits. As far as offering, you know, the two, during the stay-at-home order, a lot of local vets initiated curbside-only service. And, you know, as we were evaluating what our next steps needed to be, we started receiving a lot of feedback that spoke to how much clients appreciate that they could, could still come inside, stay with their pet and, and talk in person to our, our staff and doctors. We actually determined that because our hospital has an excellent setup for social distancing, we can accommodate both services safely. So we allow our clients the, the freedom to decide what service they're most comfortable with. Um, and then as, as far as mask, um, you know, at the beginning of May, of May, we initially implemented a mask policy and it, it only covered our staff. So what our review tree feedback told us is that it wasn't enough. Our, our clients wanted more and so did our staff. So the first week of June, we adjusted our policy um, to include both staff and clients. And then we also began requiring temperature checks. So, you know, just, just overall our, re, our review tree feedback, it's played a critical role in helping us monitor practice operations. You know, it lets us know when a safety policy is working, not working, needs to be implemented or adjusted. And you know, overall, it's just been really invaluable. Thank you, Liz. And I'll pass it back to Kim, but before I do, I'll just mention that it, it is remarkable how fast your customers and, and clients can respond to changes. Like you could make a change today and you will see it reflected in the feedback that they provide tomorrow. So it, it, as far as being real time, you do not have to wait long before clients will share with you either what they are liking or what they are not liking. So you don't have to worry about uh, delays in that. So with that, I'll pass it back to uh, Kimberly to be able to take the next portion. Thank you. Appreciate it, Liz. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. We now move on into the uh, customer panel. I, I had a few questions um, I wanted to discuss with, with Marion and, and, and Liz um, about 
you know, how, how things have impacted them, you know, ever since March, you know, when WHO declared uh, COVID-19 and, and, and the, the pandemic is actually, you know, it's, it's a thing. Um, yeah, Liz, what, what have you been doing to keep team spirits up within the park? You know, so aside from, you know, regular food deliveries, which they all love and encouraging emails, <laughs> I think one of, one of the biggest things is, is our open door policy. Every manager's door is open to every employee. You know, we coach the employees through their fears, concerns, listen to their ideas, you know, listening, acknowledging, acknowledging and validating. It goes a long way. For sure. Is that the same for you, Marion? What have you been doing to keep team spirits up? Yeah, I think um, especially at first before we ultimately created somewhat of a condition response after a while, but at first it was we emails twice a week um, to all of the staff just over communicating. I think you can't go wrong over communicating in this case. We've brought a food truck in a couple times um, towards the end of our day um, to just kind of shower the staff with time together and um, obviously social distancing in the parking lot, of course. Um, but yeah, I think surprising them with um, treats in the afternoons and, you know, again, like Liz said, I think just letting them know that it's, it's okay to talk about it. Um, giving them wellness resources for compassion fatigue, um, and some other great, great well-being resources. Um, it's tough for our staff. I mean, they, they, you know, they work in a tough industry as far as, um, you know, the compassion fatigue. So we're just really trying to head it on, head it on in the front end. Absolutely. And um, I'll take you back to, I guess, back, in, back to March, around March, that time frame, when, when um, it was declared a pandemic. How did you communicate changes to your client base and, and uh, how are you continuing this communication right now, if any? We'll go with Liz. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you know, we, we've, um, we've used and we continue to use multiple outlets, you know, to communicate um, our changes, our, we email our client base with, with the updates, we post on social media, we post to our COVID-19 blog on our website. You know, we even include a link in our text reminders that directs clients to our COVID-19 blog so that they can review the latest safety policies before they arrive for their visit. The only thing different we did, um, we did a lot of the sim same similar things as Liz. We started a weekly client email um, and mm -hmm. after a while, um, you know, that they, they were just coming to depend on that. So any news, any changes from the week before, um, also showering, social media, um, things like that. But we changed our voicemail, we changed all of our auto responses to email, texting, all of that. Um, but yeah, it's really over communicating again is was the winner for us. Mm, I see. And what changes have you made post COVID are you planning on keeping? I mean, after the pandemic clears if, if and when that time comes. Liz? We will keep our curbside pickup for medication and pet food. It, clients love it, it's great. Cool, and Marion? We definitely, um, I feel like the medication and food pickup, we, several times we talked about potentially doing some kind of curbside. Um, and this just really launched us into that. Um, but also for appointments, I think uh, we will, we would suspect um, our clients have en enjoyed it so much and voiced that they've enjoyed the convenience of curbside so much that we suspect about 50%. Um, 40 to 50% of our clientele would, would want to continue curbside. Um, and so potentially scheduling one doctor every day that does nothing but curbside appointments just to keep that, um, that convenience for our clients and also um, just a competitive edge. Mm, for sure. And what would you have done differently uh, in terms of the workflows or, or the operations, um, knowing what you know now? this? Knowing what we know now, we would have implemented the temperature checks and the mask policy earlier than what we did. Um, the staff fears were high. And as soon as those two steps were put into place, everyone calmed down and felt mm -hmm. much more safe. I see. Yeah. 
when was it when, that you started implementing uh, that? Uh, beginning May? of June. June. Oh, yeah. June. It was, a, it was about five weeks before the state mandated the mask policy. So, I mean, we had to weigh what, you know, we, we weren't sure how clients would respond, but we knew we needed to do it for our staff. How about you, Marion? Um, I, I, nothing comes to mind that I, that I would necessarily do differently. Um, we were, we were very close Eagle watch on, on everything. Um, I, nothing really comes to mind, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned a little earlier, you implemented easy vet, um, how soon before? Um, and has that, how has that really helped by moving it on to the cloud base? Yeah, so um, we, about a year before we, um, honestly, uh, almost a year, two years really, two years before, almost two years exactly before oh, yeah. COVID. Um, so it was March tw 2018. Um, so two years exactly before COVID, we switched from um, server-based software Avamark to cloud-based software EasyVet. Um, I think we uh, we were outgrowing the server-based um, model. We wanted something that was going to continue to improve and continue to move forward. Um, and EasyVet was our choice. We did a lot of research um, and, and that was the one that we ended up with. I think that the efficiency, you know, aside from COVID, the efficiency that you gain with EasyVet setup in particular, um, you know, aside from the fact that it's cloud-based, but just the way EasyVet works has been tremendous. Um, I think the integrations that we've had have worked um, a little bit better than the server-based uh, software. I'm not sure if that's because it's cloud-based, but um, those have been pretty seamless. Um, and ultimately, it's been, like I said, one of the most integral parts of um, being so successful with curbside because you can literally walk outside your building and still have your software. Um, you can use it on an iPad. You can walk out to the parking lot. You know who the client is as soon as they say their name. You can check them in from the iPad. You don't even have to go back in the building. Um, and so it's just been, it's been huge. You know, I, I'm a part of the VHMA and have great access to, you know, discussions with other managers. And I think that, you know, there seem to be many more inefficiencies to the the curbside process for our server-based uh, software practices. Um, from 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 what I'm from what I'm hearing, I think that they're the time frame of this curbside lasting longer. Um, they're they're really looking for workarounds or how can we you know get get things back inside the building. And for us personally, we're we're looking to just keep doing what we're doing, um, keeping it outside, keeping it safe for everybody. Um, our, I think our staff are much more comfortable with that idea. Our doctors are much more comfortable with it. Um, so we've been, we have felt very blessed with, to have EasyVet um, and of course Pay Junction um, at our disposal. That's awesome. Um, and I guess my last question for the this customer, Pat, panel would be what are you guys planning on doing next in terms of um, you know any changes on the horizon that you are thinking of or Liz yeah we uh, our next big project is going to be a mail order pharmacy we're super excited to get it up and running and can't wait to see where it goes great and Marion that's so funny Liz says that because we are thinking the same thing. Um, <laughs> seriously, we, um, you know, are, are in the works of, of our um, rough draft of that process, but um, same thing. And, you know, I, I think just continuing with curbside until, until we feel that, you know, the countries, we're in South Carolina right now and we're not looking so great. So <laughs> we're, we're going to stay the course for now. Um, but yeah, that, that seems to be the biggest, the biggest thing that, that makes the most sense if this is going to continue um, to try to gain some of that revenue. For sure. Thank you so much for sharing, Liz and Miriam.
Um, I now move on to the general Q&A questions. I've put together some uh, questions that the audience had shared. Uh, however, I'll, I'll do it from a chronological order where um, I'll start with a question for Dr. Jen about telemedicine. Uh, we had a question about capturing the money part for advice. Uh, like, how, are you capturing the money for advice technician or the veterinarian's time? Like, how is that done? Oh, so how is it happening, like, specifically in a consultation? Yes. I think. Um, so the way that the Televet platform works is that um, pet owners can submit a request for a consultation with a you know, part of the veterinarian team. And that is actually essentially prepaid. If the pet owner submits that request, they've already basically uh, pre-authorized payment for that. So the finances are actually captured when you close the consultation. On the veterinarian side, you can actually um, push out a consult to a pet owner as well. So if someone calls in and you want to sort of help to onboard them with the platform, you can send it directly to pet owners as well. And you have an option of, of charging or not charging. Um, and, and that is up to you to kind of scale it. You know, we see people that charge anywhere from, you know, the equivalent of a recheck exam um, all the way up to a full exam or even doing behavioral consults that way. Um, and so the app itself is actually capturing the charges through a credit card. Um, and I believe care credit and some other options are, are available for them to use um, for pet owners. And then um, that money then gets transferred. I believe it's like once a month, it basically gets dropped over to the practices um, specific account system as well. As from the practice management standpoint, you can track specific consultations that have been done by each doctor, by each user. And so we often, or there's been questions about like production pay, things of that nature. So there are ways to, to track that within the app and get reporting um, done on that. So hope that specifically sort of answers the question. Um, yeah. I have another one about how, what's the best way to convey value to pet owners about paying for telemedicine? Because I understand that that was initially a barrier yeah. um, for them to utilize the service. Yeah, so there's, I think, a few conversation points I would have there. So for me, I guess I would say I feel like I'm a little ahead of the curve in the terms of we've been talking about this for a long time. Um, one of the easy places to really engage and get clients started is, again, with those follow-ups. And you can even offer those as free, if you will, through the app. Um, and so you don't necessarily have to charge. Um, but, again, getting users into the workflow of actually utilizing them. I do think um, what you'll actually find, and there's some data out there, I don't have this directly in front of me, that pet owners that are engaged in using telemedicine actually wind up reaching out to communicate with you more often. Um, they may not be coming into the building for physically more exams throughout the year, if that makes sense, but they do have more touch points with the veterinarian team throughout the year. Um, and so talking about, you know, what is the value of this? And I'll often query pet owners um, at the end of a consultation of like, how was this for communication? What did you think about it? And many, many people are like, this is amazing to have the ease, the access to our veterinarian, right? They're reaching their individual team and not just some random nebulous person out there, <laughs> um, right? So, I mean, there is something to be said for that personal touch. Um, and the other way that we sort of um, have dealt with some of that pushback is, you know, you will still have clients that say, well, I want to do it the way I've always done it. And that's totally fine. And so from our workflow, when someone calls, what our conversation is, we're going to try to do telemedicine first. It doesn't mean it's going to solve everything, but it's definitely a way to start the conversation. If that pet does wind up needing to come in the hospital, we do um, charge them less than a full exam, if that makes sense. So it, we're conveying that pet owners are not getting charged twice. Um, but I do think there is a lot of value in your time and your technician's time. So, and the other piece is telling people telemedicine and using Televet is probably going to be the quickest way for you as a pet owner to get your answers. You're still welcome to leave a message. You're still welcome to leave an email. You're still welcome to do those other things. But those are going to be triaged probably at the end of the day from someone, whereas um, telemedicine is going to be the most rapid way we can onboard and get that question answered for you. So that's a lot of ways of saying that we're really pushing towards that as option one um, and just teaching and coaching our clientele to really work that way. 
Great. Thanks for that insight. Mm -hmm. That's that's really, really more good tips. <laughs> yeah. Now I'll move on to Casey. Or we have a few pay junction related questions as well. Would you be able to explain a little bit more about the pay junction email or text payment link? Um, does pay junction have the capability to text for payment? We do with the, the quick answer here is going to be yes. I saw the question pop up twice. Sorry. I was a little confused how to get to the Q and a, even though it was really easy down there at the bottom, uh, te <laughs> technical difficulties on my <laughs> end. Um, so the quick answer is yes. So anyone who's using pay junction hopefully knows about the hosted payment solution. And then we've seen some really creative ways on how easy vet users will set up uh, essentially a template with that hosted payments, edit the suffix, which is the amount, and then either text it or email it out through easy vet. And it's almost a soft integration. Um, I'm not sure how much I can talk about this, but there's something, something much more exciting coming in the very near future that easy vet is working on to make that, significantly better, significantly easier, significantly more user friendly. Um, if you have questions about that, I would say ask everybody at EasyVet and you can even tell them that Casey said something was coming. I will take the flack coming back my way. I'll be sure to, to use that phrase. Casey, Casey told, told me to say that. Casey said this. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Another question I have is regarding the Apple Pay comment. Uh, so even if my practice is able to accept contactless, pay, contactless payments like Apple Pay, we're not technically not completely contactless in our payments? Right, that's, that's kind of what we talked about. Those, those three areas where exposure can occur. Uh, there's this, this really um, interesting thing going on in our industry where contactless, people are trying to frame near field communication, NFC, Apple Pay as contactless. Um, we don't necessarily believe and it's just not completely contactless. If you are signing paper receipts, if you're touching a pen, if you're doing anything that can create any sort of transmission from customer to customer, staff to customer, or staff to staff is not contactless. So take a look at those things. Visa, MasterCard, Discover, they've changed their rules and they are now you no longer have to take uh, signatures at the front. You no longer have to do those things. So try to be as contactless as you possibly can. Uh, that was the question. And I, another one was, why would I still want to collect a signature for a remote payment when it's not required anymore for in-person payments? Fantastic question. Again, Visa, MasterCard, Discover American Express, they've, they've laxed their requirements for that card present environment. It's a traditionally not very fraud friendly. So what they've done is eliminated that contact point. However, when you move to a card not present transaction, uh, you get lumped into all card not present transactions. So the signature is still not necessarily required, but a very, very strong Thing to have in the event of a dispute or anything like that. So it's best to try and get a signature if you can when it's a card not present transaction. And then Kimberly, I see Liz yes. just threw another question in Q&A. Uh, Liz, you can reach out to myself or Ian or even the EasyVet team, but mainly myself and Ian and we'll walk you through the workflow as it exists today. And then definitely bother the EasyVet team about the, <laughs> the new and improved one that's coming shortly. For sure. Um, I direct a question back to Dr. Jen. We had one come through uh, for Televet uh, asking, how do you charge for a recheck on Televet? Are practices able to set up multiple price points for a consult? And lastly, can the practice start a consult with the client as opposed to the client starting it? Yeah, uh, so the, um, when you set up your practice uh, through Televet, you will automatically be asked to set some default pricing for what we call consultations, so a full consultation, uh, and you'll have a follow-up or a recheck price. When a pet owner reaches out to you to start a consultation, they only see the one price point, because if you give people two, they'll always choose the lesser one, right? <laughs> um, as a veterinary team member, however, you can send a consult to the client, and you can either send it at the, the recheck price, which tends to be reduced, or you can send it at the full consultation price. You actually, even before you send it, can really scale it to any number that you would like. 
Um, and if for some reason you choose at the end to charge less, you do have the option on the veterinarian side to close that. So yes, you basically set your own prices, but you really have imminent flexibility when it comes to that. So um, I do think it's, it's nice to manage that expectation of pet owners of, of what you're gonna charge for this. I know for me with my particular rechecks on surgeries, for example, we build in that charge on the day of the procedure. So I don't charge pet owners separately for that individual recheck. We essentially just do it as a no charge, but I still want to see and check in with how that pet's doing. So there's a multitude of ways you could do it. Thanks, Dr. Jin. And for VetSource, John, we have a question about who, who exactly pays for the shipping. Is it the practice or the customer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so actually, all diet, so all nutrition and food, um, anything that's on an auto shipment, including those uh, single dose remind me, uh, any order over $49, that will ship for free. Uh, so the vast majority of what we send out the door on our standard shipping does ship for free. Uh, for those that don't fit into those buckets, which is honestly a fraction of what we ship out, that would be passed along to the pet owner. And um, how much does the email marketing cost? You showed us a few examples. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, another good one. So that both the promotions that are including in that are sponsored by that source, uh, as is taking advantage of that service top mail. Um, so free to utilize really impactful driving awareness and revenue along with that. So definitely a good one to, to leverage if, if you're a vet source user. Hmm. And for review tree, Michael, one, just one question. Um, does, does your tool incorporate um, the collection of feedback and the pushing of the happy reviews, you know, to the public platforms, is it, are there different packages or it's just one package? No, they, they can be separate um, or combined. So the way that the system is set up or the platform is set up is you can either do just the survey collection or you can do the surveys and the review generation piece, but they can be separated out if you want one but not the other. And how easy is it for practices to manage multi-location? You know, like one, one business with like five locations. Sure. Yeah. So we have it, um, an organizational view set up so that it's as simple as switching between locations. They can give different privileges to different users. So maybe the practice manager for location A should only have access to feedback from that location. We can make it so when they log in, they only see the responses that relate to their location, whereas the executive team probably wants to be able to have access to everything so they get a more universal and global view. So we support multiple locations as well as multiple divisions. So if you need to separate you know, ophthalmology from oncology feedback, all of that ability to slice and dice based on specialty and location is all built in. Cool. Conscious of the time, I We'll bring this webinar uh, to an end. Uh, it's been wonderful, wonderful to have all of you on here. And this, you know, if we have gone over time just a little bit, but it's fair enough with having so many, so many speakers. So yeah, on behalf of our panel here today, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for tuning in and bringing up some great questions. Uh, as mentioned before, a recording will be provided once it's been uploaded, along with the contact details of um, our partners right here. I'll we'll share that with you uh, through the slides. Um, we'll email, out, email, email this all out to everyone. And as soon as this webinar closes, a quick survey will pop up for our attendees, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on any topic suggestions for future webinars. So up until next time, stay safe and healthy, everyone. <laughs>